Hello and welcome back to the KCC channel. I'm Rob and I hope you are having a wonderful day today. Today, we're jumping into a single story, epically long nuclear revenge. Before we start, if you're new here, make sure to hit that subscribe button. It's completely free and you can always change your mind later. But if you stick around, there just might be some tasty cookies in your near future. All right, this story comes to us from Wake Up Call 23. Ex-boyfriend violates me and denies it. I ruin his life. Let's jump right in. At the beginning of these events I'm about to share, I was 20 years old, now 21. I was involved in a five-month relationship with my ex-boyfriend, Jack Butt X, also was 20, now 21, who attends the same school as me. We started dating in December and I broke up with him in May. At that time, I was taking a gap semester from school for previous unrelated reasons to the events being told here, and was instead working full-time. We went into this relationship both as each other's first. We were also subsequently part of leadership in a student-run group, with both of us being elected shortly before I broke up with him. This is a story of what happened in this relationship, as well as afterwards, that subsequently resulted in me ruining his life. I toyed with keeping this story to myself, but the closure from my experience includes getting it off my chest. And maybe some internet strangers can help me feel a little better about everything that happened. I won't go overly specific and try to spare my identity, hence the throwaway account, but anyone who knows of the fallout probably knows who I am. To those, I stand by my actions. And if my ex is reading this, you deserve so much worse than what you got. You are subhuman scum. Part 1. The Start I did not know Jack Butt at first before we started seeing each other. A mutual friend, Bestie, introduced the two of us because we shared similar interests. We hit it off and went on a few dates over the span of a few weeks. One night, Jack Butt came to my place. We watched a movie and cuddled through the night. This was what I'd consider the official start of the relationship. We were seeing each other pretty much daily, even when he went home to visit his family. I lived within a reasonable driving distance. The relationship moved in a way I'd consider relatively quick in hindsight. He also gaslit the words I love you out of me two weeks in by misshaping words I spoke into the phrase. Jackbutt also mentioned shortly after we started dating that he had a previous ex in high school who was closeted, but the details I have are relatively faint. They were all disclosed by him. He mentioned that this relationship abruptly ended when the high school ex accused him of SA, telling his friends, his high school admin, and his family. This reportedly drove my ex to therapy and ruined his social life. My ex swore up and down that he would never do such a thing to anyone, but wanted to be upfront with me at the beginning, though we were pretty much exclusive at the time he disclosed this. I, obviously taken aback by this, didn't think that he was capable of something like that, and told him as such, and comforted him for sharing such a vulnerable experience with me. I largely forgot about this afterward though. Part 2. The Relationship When I first started dating Jackbutt, we discussed our preferences, what we were looking for, the standard relationship spiel. He told me that he was looking for someone masculine, and I told him I wanted the same. We both assured each other that we were masculine figures, but only one of us was telling the truth, which I'd come to find out during the relationship. He was honestly quite femme-presenting. He would say things even before we started dating that, in retrospect, seem somewhat off-putting or outright manipulative without raising red flags at the time. Again, this behavior came habitual throughout the relationship. Shortly after I started dating him, I joined a student-run design group that Jackbutt was a prominent figure of. I had been exploring joining this group or one similar to it, but dating him at the time gave me the confidence to move forward with it. I didn't play a huge role in it initially, as I was working full-time, but I began making acquaintances with those in the group, as I was generally regarded to be a friendly face. Jackbutt had acquaintances in this group that he would make comments about that were vile and sexual in nature. One of them was a mutual acquaintance to the both of us, and the things he would say made me question whether Jackbutt was aware that we were in a monogamous relationship. These comments seemed to be attempts to invoke jealousy to me, but I never gave in. 
However, they only perpetuated the red flags he was giving off. Part 3, My Own Doubts, The Break, and The Breakup I would argue my doubts began sometime around month 3. Some of the doubts that I felt involved the deepest questioning of my sexuality in my lifetime, as well as whether I was truly attracted to Jackbutt. I had a few people in my life that I had been attracted to for a while, and intruding thoughts of me being with them began to run through my head. The red flags Jackbutt had displayed began to illuminate in my head, and slowly, these doubts I felt began to affect the relationship. I had never questioned my sexuality severely, as I kind of always knew that I was a gay man. I realized that I was starting to lose the spark I thought I had felt towards Jackbutt when we first started dating. He also started to become more aggressive in initiating and when I turned him down. One time, when I declined, Jackbutt angrily looked at me and asked me if I was sure that I was actually gay. This question rubbed me the wrong way because I had long since shared the story with him about the discovery of my sexuality. I had known I was gay for nine years at that time, though I had only been out for two years. Needless to say, Jackbutt slept alone that night. I worked to mend my side of the relationship, though there were many challenges to overcome. The gap in compatibility was quickly growing evident between the two of us and started causing tension. I had mentally begun to exit the relationship as I was beginning to feel guilty for not keeping him happy. Jackbutt also was insistent I quit my full-time job so I could go back to school and properly focus on it, and the job had started to demand more from me, up to 10 hours of overtime per week sometimes. I was steadfast on staying employed. I was a manager of a place I had worked at for five years, and this furthered the tension as he felt I was choosing work over him. Around the end of April, there were elections being held for leadership on the design team that Jackbutt and I now were both a part of. They had an empty position for their treasury role, for which I had experience with my job, so I ran for the role and got it. He had been gunning for a project management role and was given it as well. This happened in conjunction with the relationship turning rocky, but didn't seem like it would be a problem. It is important to note that this design team was quite important to Jackbutt. He put a lot of time into it. It was his main thing outside of school, and almost all his friends that he had were in it. I wanted to make sure that I could help this continue to thrive for him, so I kept trying to mend the relationship, though it was slowly wearing me down. One morning in early May, as I was sleeping at Jackbutt's apartment, Jackbutt attempted to make a move on me at 3.30 in the morning. I, asleep at the time because I had to work at 7, told him that I didn't want this and turned back over and went back to sleep. This seemed to stop him, but only temporarily. I stirred again at about 5.30 because I felt something on me. Jackbutt was now on top of me. I tried to fall back asleep, but he continued. I, disgusted, got out of bed and showered to get ready for work. He did not say anything to me in this time frame, not even an apology. As I was about to leave his apartment, he stopped me and said that we should take a break. I tearfully agreed and left for work, feeling like I had done something wrong. The break was mentally relieving and challenging for me. It felt right being apart, but didn't feel right about everything that happened. I was still questioning my sexuality and was facing ever-increasing challenges with work. I was tasked with managing two departments at once and worked almost every day during the break. I didn't talk to any of my friends about the break because I felt like I was the one that caused it. A few days later, Jackbutt called me because he couldn't stand not being with me and wanted to be together again. I reluctantly eased back into it but had mentally known the break was the beginning of the end. At this point, he had moved back with his family about two hours away for an internship, so this post-break relationship was basically long distance. We talked, I told him I was going through tough times with work to try to justify my off behavior, and he began texting me sappy daily messages, to which I largely ignored because they felt shallow and they only made me feel worse. I responded to some of them or would pick up his phone calls but this was mostly an effort to show that I was still alive and somewhat engaged in the relationship. On a Saturday morning, 
Jackbutt called me super early and left a voicemail to the tune of an ultimatum, asking whether I was willing to make things work or if he needed to move on. This call was the final straw for me. I knew that this was when I needed to end it. I wrote a brief letter, called him back, and read it to him. I broke up with him over the phone. This was not my finest hour, but he left me no choice. He was entirely taken aback by me calling their relationship off and tried to ask me to make it work manipulatively. I ended the relationship amicably because I thought I had done something wrong and he agreed that we could remain friends. <laughs> he called me early the next morning begging me to reconsider and that we could work it out. The phone call woke me up this time and I simply told him goodbye. I went to work that afternoon and had a mental breakdown. I felt guilty for the breakup and felt like everything that happened was my fault. I wound up putting my two weeks in at my job. I wound up staying and am still employed there unbeknownst to him and texted Jackbutt that I had done so. He responded that he was happy for me and that is the last direct communication I have from him. Part 4, The Discovery The summer was relatively refreshing for me. I began to work on improving myself, made some new friends, and cut back my work to a healthy amount, all while getting back to my school course load. I didn't talk to Jackbutt at all during the remainder of summer. In fact, I didn't see him until late August after fall classes resumed, when he passed by me with a new guy, New Boy. When I saw Jackbutt walk by with New Boy, he pretended to not see me, but I couldn't hold back an ugly cackle. Jackbutt clearly didn't want anything to do with me, but the cackle was from seeing Jackbutt with someone new, because the manipulative statement he had made when I dumped him became obvious. New Boy was not exactly a good looking guy either, which only added insult to injury. A few weeks later, I had a falling out with the elected president of the design team. I was tasked to compile a part of a report that required others to do their part first. This report was due on a day that I had plans that could not be put off, and no one did their part until the last minute. Thus, I was unable to do my part, and another board member wound up doing it for me. I was transparent with my plans and why I couldn't complete it on my own, and the board member apologized to me for stretching me thin like that. The president, however, was angered. She berated me and aggressively doubled down when I tried to justify why I couldn't do my part. The exchange drove me to nearly rage quit the design team, but I held my head up and instead got to thinking about a path that took the high road. One thought led to another, and suddenly I was thinking about why my relationship with Jackbutt failed. We are supposed to be in correspondence with one another, but he elected to not work with me, which was partially why I couldn't do my task. I simply didn't work with him either. At the same time as the falling out with President, the design group had a photo shoot for all elected board members to receive headshot photos. I, not being close with any of the leadership, was mostly minding my own business. Jackbutt, however, brought New Boy along to try and show off in front of me. New Boy was not in the design group. This quickly became evident when they began cuddling directly in front of me. This wound up being a bad call on Jackbutt's part, as it only made me consider further why our relationship had fallen apart. In these thoughts, I thought back to that fateful May morning, and a terrifying realization came across me. The happenings of that morning were textbook SA. In hindsight, I'm shocked I did not realize it sooner. I realized I was a victim, and it was hard to come to terms with it. I initially diffused it with humor in a weird coping strategy involving denial, but told some of my closest friends of the discovery so I didn't feel alone. I also pondered how I should handle it moving forward. I also had never returned the two things he left in my apartment, his key and a shirt that he really liked, one of his favorites. I threw the key away, he probably had his locks changed, and I wound up burning the shirt. Then, the memory of what Jackbutt said to me about his high school ex ran through my head, which I had initially forgotten. I had been put in a mental trap that Jackbutt was not capable of SA, and this is probably why I had mentally blocked the realization of me being SA'd for so long. 
Given what I experienced and based off what he said, I cannot say that Jackbutt did not SA his high school ex, and this terrified me. I knew what I needed to do. I didn't believe that approaching Jackbutt was the best move, but I felt that I was under heightened pressure since he started dating Newboy and he could potentially do it again. Part 5. The Reporting Given that it took me over 5 months to discover the SA, pressing charges was out of the question. I needed some form of administrative documentation if I couldn't press charges, and I wanted this by the book because I was disgusted that I was so severely wronged. Fortunately, my school has a program for Title IX that handles SA, so I called them up and filed a report. In this report, I outlined in detail the happenings of that May morning and requested an informal resolution where my report was documented, but an amicable agreement was to be reached between Jackbutt and I. There was a formal route that could result in academic repercussions as it went in front of a student honor court, but given my lack of hard evidence, there was an extremely high chance of the case simply being thrown out like it never happened. The informal resolution still logged the incident just in case anyone were to report him again down the line. The advisor that worked on my case had to be impartial, but he was on my side the entire time and reassured me that I was handling it correctly. In this resolution, I requested that Jackbutt step down from his role in the design group, apologize to me, disclose the happenings to any current and future partners, considered going back to therapy, and be re-educated on the concept of consent. I asked for him to step down as the lack of communication between us in the team was starting to impact my work in the group further, but I knew that it would also be a difficult decision for him to make. This was intentional, as I wanted the consequences of his actions to sting. The latter four requests were semi-filler, but still had purpose, including covering my bases while staying by the book. The requested apology was so I could feel some form of closure, by him at least acknowledging he did wrong. The disclosure of the happenings was borderline intended to be a homewrecker for his new relationship, but also, this is a reasonable thing to disclose to your partner. The therapy request was a low blow, since he claimed to have gone before, but a genuine ask, and the consent education was a dire plea, because if he can't recognize that being asleep isn't consent, I'm not sure what he considers it to be. Part 6. The Interim and the Report's End In the midst of the report being filed and Title IX working on reaching out to Jackbutt, the governing body at my school that manages student-run organizations deemed me ineligible to be the design group's treasurer. Their system is really backwards and their reasoning was stupid. I didn't have enough credits to be considered eligible. They demanded a replacement treasurer. President, who suddenly was nice because she needed something from me again, held a meeting and asked me if I'd be okay still doing my job, but just marking someone else down as the treasurer to satisfy the governing body. I agreed. Jackbutt was in this meeting and quickly volunteered to put his name down with a smirk on his face. I, also smirking, simply said that was fine. President then moved to crack a joke. She started to say how it was funny that Jackbutt was taking my position since she quickly stopped speaking, widened her eyes, and looked at myself, then Jackbutt. Those few words told me that Jackbutt had mentioned our relationship's end. The entire elected board was friends with each other, excluding me. And it also demonstrated to me that they were talking poorly about me behind my back. I firmly believe the comment she was about to make was her finding it funny that Jackbutt was taking my position because we had previously dated. But she stopped herself when she realized she was about to talk badly about me to my face. I smiled, feigned ignorance, and quietly dismissed myself from the meeting. Jackbutt, on the other hand, was not staying in touch with Title IX. They reached him after about two months and he initially admitted to the advisor that he did not disagree with the instances I described, but wanted me to know that he was learning intimacy. I politely told the advisor that I could understand to a point, as I was in the same boat as him, but that doesn't excuse his actions. 
I also asked the advisor if he had decided on the resolution, to which he hadn't. The advisor then attempted to call Jackbutt back to get a decision from him on whether he would follow my request. But Jackbutt began dodging phone calls for about two weeks. These two weeks were some of the hardest of my life. The ugliest parts of the relationship were playing through my head nonstop. I was drinking nearly nightly to ease my mind, not the proudest hour. I wrote a long emotional letter regarding my thoughts that was subsequently emailed to Title IX. I did this to document the feelings I had while further strengthening my case, which to people outside of myself was relying on anecdotal evidence. I called Title IX back, expressed my concerns once again, and they thanked me for the letter because it provided additional perspective from my side. I requested that when they reached Jackbutt to give him this ultimatum if he was stepping down. I also asked they let him know if he chose not to that I would step down, but be thorough in explaining why I stepped down. I worded it intentionally because I had begun to plan my exit with the design group and was banking on Jackbutt valuing his pride over accountability. I was right. After those two weeks, Jackbutt finally picked up and told Title IX that everything that happened was consensual, I am not stepping down, and that is all I have to say. Title IX immediately called me with this news. I was simultaneously shocked and not surprised. Even the Title IX advisor was floored that Jackbutt had doubled back on his previous statements. I asked if the previous words and admission would hold up if I were to press charges, but because Title IX is protected speech, it wouldn't fly in court. I thanked the Title IX advisor for his help, knowing exactly what I needed to do. Jackbutt had said the exact words needed for me to do my part. All I have to say. Part 7. The Disclosure The aforementioned call came to me at 3pm on a Friday, shortly after I got home from classes. Less than 20 minutes later, I was sitting in the office of the design group's faculty advisor. I told him what happened and what I was planning to do, including my resignation. Jackbutt's misconduct had not only wrecked my mental state, but because I was outright afraid of being around him. I was hardly participating in the design group outside of my administrative duties after I discovered that I had been essayed by him. Faculty advisor was extremely sympathizing with what I described and directed me to hold a meeting with the elected board, including president, to announce my departure. He gave me otherwise free will to figuratively set off a bomb. I organized a meeting with the entire board for the following Monday, sans Jack Butt, and alerted them that the meeting was important, all while keeping the operation under wraps from Jack Butt. Come the Monday meeting, I had created a fun PowerPoint presentation that created a quick slideshow touching on all the topics mentioned above. The board arrived slightly tardy and were chattering amongst themselves until I launched the PowerPoint with the words wake up call displayed on the screen. I thought the title was clever. I started by thanking them for showing up on such short notice. I announced my resignation, a background of our relationship, what Jackbutt did to me, and what I did, including making the Title IX report and what is involved by doing that. The board sat there in silence, absolutely stunned at what I was presenting them. I further went on to delegate my treasury duties, offering to assist anyone that needed it aside from Jackbutt. I slyly mentioned that Jackbutt was definitively the one responsible for my duties due to his quick volunteering before, and I looked at President directly when I said it. The look in her eye at that moment was sheer terror. That moment of his volunteering and her comment afterward flashed through her mind. I paused for a moment to regain my composure. It was a hard presentation. I held back tears giving it, then continued with the presentation. I read the group's governing documentation and pasted portions from it in the presentation. I outlined their impeachment process and recommended that they vote to remove Jackbutt from his elected position. I tossed in the group's zero tolerance policy on SA in the presentation for good measure. I reiterated that Jackbutt had violated me while I was unconscious and questioned how anyone could ever consider those acts consensual or humane. 
everyone else in the room was crying by the end of the presentation, which somewhat surprised me at the time. Again, they were all friends with Jack Butt, but were not close with me. They thanked me for telling them what happened, told me they needed time to process everything, but they would keep me updated on what they chose to do. The board also asked me if I would reconsider staying if he stepped down or was otherwise removed, to which I told them no. My justification was that my impact in the group was too deeply impacted by his behavior, and that staying around would only be keeping my wounds open. I left the meeting with a huge weight taken off my shoulders. Part 8, The Last Interaction with Jack Butt X I walked back to my car after the meeting and texted a professional resignation message in the group's communication channel, citing personal reasons and wishing the best for the group. This would be the first of the communications that Jackbutt would receive related to the meeting that had just happened. I directed any treasury concerns to President while they worked to appoint a replacement. These communications were kept professional as I intended to come out of the situation with grace, any malice could have disrupted my efforts to be credible. I then drove over to faculty advisor's office with the intent of catching him up on the meeting that happened. I instead pulled into the parking lot to see Jack Butt's car parked outside. I thought to myself, oh great, he's probably inside, this might be fun. Coincidentally, Bestie was also stopping by the building and I ran into her in the parking lot. I hadn't seen her in a while, so we hugged and I told her that I had just stepped down from my position and that I was doing pretty rough. My mind was still quite fogged from the meeting I just had. I told Bestie that I wanted to talk, but right then wasn't a good time and invited her to talk later. She was entirely unaware of the happenings between Jackbutt and I. She knew we broke up, but not why. As I turned to move inside, I saw Jackbutt sitting in his car and I realized exactly what just happened. From his perspective, he thought he had dodged the Title IX bullet. He saw me hug Bestie, our mutual friend, and had likely been reading the resignation message I had sent. Furthermore, I was going into the building where the design group runs out of, which was, not proudly, a relatively rare sight. To top it all off, his phone was also likely blowing up from the elected board calling and messaging him to figure out what was going on. Faculty advisor wasn't in his office when I dropped by, so I messaged him an update of what happened and sat inside for a minute to collect myself after everything that just happened. I then walked past his car to get back to mine, ignoring his presence, and I left. I couldn't imagine what Jackbutt was feeling at that moment, though it was likely some combination of terror and shock. It selfishly made me feel good. Part 9, The Fallout The following day, the rest of the elected board reached out to me mostly individually to express their sympathy and check in with me. I had kept what happened to about 8 pertinent individuals in order to not paint the entire group in a bad light. I still wasn't sure if the group was going to follow through with the request that I made to remove him or if they even believed me. Turns out, they did. That evening, I received a notification from the elected board's group chat, as well as the group's general chat, with a message that tagged everyone from Jackbutt, stating that he was resigning immediately upon facing immediate removal. He name-dropped me in this message, and stated that I had made false allegations that were investigated by the school and dropped. They were not dropped. Title IX doesn't simply get dropped. He also claimed that he sought legal representation for the claims. None of what I did was illegal, so I call BS here. And stated that he was disappointed by his friends. He spun it as them choosing false claims over their friendship. He then somehow sent this message as an email to every person who had ever been a part of the group at my school. 700 plus people got this email with my name on it at 9.30 p.m. at night, and my direct messages start going crazy. Why did I get this? What is happening? Are you okay? I don't know what's going on here, but he seems like he's hiding something. What was alleged? These were just some of the messages I got. I responded to most of them by simply stating that no one should have ever gotten that email, but to not worry about me. But I was livid. 
Faculty advisor messaged me, he was livid. The entire elected board was livid and in shock that he sent that message. I messaged faculty advisor to meet the following morning so he could catch me up on the internal fallout I had missed. Turns out, the elected board immediately reached out to Jackbutt and said that he needed to resign or face immediate removal. Jackbutt threw a tantrum and sent out the message, which he felt vindicated himself from any wrongdoing. The message made the board even more convinced that they made the right decision, because they thought Jackbutt was hiding something with the defensive tone he held in the email. In this meeting, faculty advisor confided in me that Jackbutt was also banned from the lab space because of that email, which was extremely unprofessional and painted the entire group in a bad light. He name dropped the group in the email as well. Because of the severity of the email and the now on record events that had occurred between Jackbutt and I, the dean of my school was also informed. Faculty advisor assured me that I had handled the situation properly and commended me for taking the high road. I had not once spoken poorly about Jackbutt to the elected board, nor did I drag the group through the mud, though I very much had the opportunity to do so. I made him aware of the conflict between President and I in this meeting. I also spoke to Bestie that day, who also received that email, and told her everything that happened. She had remained friends with Jackbutt after our breakup, and she told me that he said I had ghosted him. She had not previously asked for my side. Remember those sappy text messages he sent before he asked if he should move on? Yeah, my not responding to all of those. I had responded to some, and I had called him in between them as well, was what he framed as ghosting. So I cleared that air with her too. She was absolutely floored that he could do such a thing, but we reconciled over many questionable behaviors he had displayed throughout my relationship, and independently, her friendship with him. Part 10, Wrap Up with these events, I would say that I received my closure, or at least as close to closure as one can get in this type of situation. I don't think that Jackbutt believes he's done anything wrong in this situation, but honestly, I'm okay with that. I simply stated what happened, and it caused a daisy chain of reactions that culminated in Jackbutt losing almost every single one of his friends, as the heavy majority are in the group and were made aware of what happened. His passion, the design group, and the space that he used to spend most of his free hours in, the group's lab. He also lost faculty advisor's respect, who is a very prominent figure in our school, as well as Jackbutt X's now former boss. The school is keeping an eye on him now, while also potentially considering disciplinary action on him. When I say that the group was important to Jackbutt X, I mean it. When he wasn't in class, he was usually working in the group or spending time with the friends in it. I don't know what he is doing now, and honestly, I don't care. I don't see him around anymore. Remember New Boy? Allegedly, Jackbutt X was still together with him at the time I gave the PowerPoint. To keep my stance of being professional through my actions, I am not going to dig around to find out if that was the case. I don't know who the boyfriend is, and Jackbutt X does not have social media presence. I could ask Bestie, but I believe that new boy received word of the incidences I brought forward. I suspect that Jackbutt X may be single as a result. Regarding the high school X, I do not know who he is either, or if he even existed. This could have been a really screwed up lie that Jackbutt X made. I made my decision to report Jackbutt X in the first place by going off the assumption that what Jackbot X told me was the truth, that there were previous allegations made. I gave him the opportunity to take accountability for his actions, but he instead chose his pride and ruined his life in the process. As I initially stated in the beginning, Jackbot X deserves so much worse for what he did to me, and most of the karma he received was due to his own pride-sparing actions. I would have sent him to jail if I could have, but the evidence I held would not be strong enough to put him there. He may not presently believe that he has done anything wrong, but those closest to him know that he did, and to me, the social repercussions he faced seem like almost suitable punishment. Thank you for reading. In the comment section for this one, it was brought up a few times about how OP wouldn't realize that it was SA in the first place, 
and that they had to come to realize this down the road. If you've never been in a situation like that yourself, you are not qualified to question somebody else on how it happened or how they handled it. Also, OP says that they were 20 when this happened and they're only 21 now, so there's absolutely no statute of limitations here. They could report it through official channels, and they really should, because there need to be some repercussions for this person. Otherwise, it may happen again in the future with someone else. After reading this story, all 35 minutes of it, I'm sitting back and thinking, OP didn't do enough in this case. I would love to hear what you guys think. Comment down below. Do you think OP did enough in this case? Or do you think they should have reported this to the proper authorities and not just got him kicked out of some group? Check out OP linked in the description down below. I thank you for watching. I hope you have a wonderful day and we'll see you tomorrow.